Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Loop. I'm the secretary of Travers Area Historical Society. We'll get our technical stuff figured out. This is not working. That's okay. I, I'll do a quick intro and most everyone should be muted. Um, we're going to try to, you know, put our microphone back and forth to who needs to speak. And I'm just going to say a little bit of an introduction. Again, I'm Jennifer Loop. I'm the secretary of Traverse Area Historical Society. Um, we are a local nonprofit. We're trying to present and preserve and protect local history of the Traverse City area and the region. And we like to put together these programs. We've been doing these virtually for the last few months, at least a program a month on different topics of local history. And so if you're interested in our organization, uh, feel free to visit traversehistory.org and you'll find more information. But today we're gonna pass this along to Chris Roxburgh. He is a published videographer and photographer and a diver. And we're gonna talk about shipwrecks of the Great Lakes today and uh, passionate, he is also a passionate environmentalist for the Great Lakes. So we will do questions for Chris um, at the end. You also can put questions and comments in the chat uh, and we'll try to go back through those and look at those at the end of the presentation. Um, and I'm gonna pass things along to him now. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. Thanks for coming to my presentation. Uh, I have a lot of shipwreck photography to share uh, with a bit of history and some diving stories as well. Um, I've been diving for uh, over four years now and continue to train and, and get better, uh, get more you know, technical in the diving realm. Um, so as, as I do that, I, I continue to explore uh, additional remote shipwrecks. A lot of people don't see. Uh, one of my favorite areas uh, recently is this in my own hometown, uh, Leelanau County. Uh, we have the Manitou Passage and the Manitou Islands and Fox Islands, and they're just littered with shipwrecks. Um, so we'll be sharing some of those as well, some unknown ones too. So uh, let me share the screen here. Is that, can you guys see my screen? We Does anyone see, see my screen? We see everybody. We see can all the see participants. Can you see my presentation? No. No, all you right, just a second. Yeah. Uh, the host disabled the attendee screen sharing. I need to have the host let me share my screen. Let's see. I'm sorry, give me just a second. Okay. Here we go. Does that work? Can you guys see my screen now? Yep. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, so this, this picture here is from South Fox Island and I took the picture uh, underwater looking up at the South Fox Lighthouse. I thought it was a pretty cool uh, view. You know, it wasn't an over under shot. It was completely underwater, but you can still see the lighthouse. Um, so that's kind of my introduction here. Uh, this shipwreck is the Westmoreland. She sank on December 7th, 1854 en route to Fort Mackinac with 100,000 gold coins or 10,000 gold coins and 280 barrels of whiskey. Uh, get my pug here, he's being a little menace. Um, so the Westmoreland is in the Manitou Passage and it's a, a seldom dove shipwreck. There's not many people uh, in the world that have actually even dove it. Um, Ross Richardson found this wreck in 2010 after shipwreck hunters have looked for it for over 150 years. This is the anchor. This is the anchor in the bow. 
Uh, very large anchor still hangs off the vessel and it sits around 190 feet deep. So it's a very technical dive. Uh, no, no mooring lines or mooring buoys. We had to deploy our own mooring buoy uh, near the vessel so we didn't anchor into it. Um, and it was quite a ways out into the Manitou Passage in a unspecified location that hasn't been shared publicly yet. Uh, this is the hogging arches. You can see in the left and right. And as I was following the diver, we noticed some uh, ornate artifacts that are laying on the deck and you can see to the left. And I'm gonna actually uh, keep going here. So it's kind of, as we get closer, you can see the, the artifacts are starting to get more illuminated. And, and there you can see a plate and the ornate water jug on the deck. Uh, these are the lifeboat davits of the Westmoreland and they're empty, uh, telling a very tragic story of survival. Um, half the crew perished on this ship while it was uh, en route to Fort Mackinac to deliver the gold and whiskey for the provisions in winter in 1854. Um, so the lifeboat davits are kind of a reminder of the fact that this is a grave site. Some call it a ghost ship. Um, so it, we, as we approach the lifeboat davits, we swim through them and you can see the helm, the wheel there. That's where the, the captain used to steer the vessel. Uh, she's 200 feet long and encountered 20 foot waves, uh, December 7th, 1854 with gale winds. And she was already leaking previously from a few days prior as she made her way into the Manitou Passage, um, encountered this severe storm. Um, and the water was leaking in so fast that the bucket brigade could not get the water out of fast enough. So the water actually extinguished the boilers and she lost steering. The vessel turned to the side and was just swallowed up by, by Lake Michigan in the Manitou Passage. And uh, 16 people made it to shore, two people perished on shore, and the remaining 14 out of 35 had to hike soaking wet in freezing conditions in a blizzard for 40 miles to the nearest town. Um, and, and those are the survivors that told the story of the Westmoreland. Now we're gonna jump to North Fox Island. This is an unidentified rabbit steamer on North Fox Island that I was given the coordinates for by historian, maritime historian, Brendan Ballot out of Wisconsin that I actually got quite a bit of information uh, on the Fox Islands wrecks from Brennan because there's not a, any information online uh, about these wrecks. And actually this, this is uh, some of the first pictures ever shared and taken of this particular uh, shipwreck. This is another side view of it. Kind of looks like fish bones. Kind of gave it the, uh, the nickname of fish bones. Everybody says it's kind of what it looks like. Um, the wreck I, I believe has been salvaged I'm not sure why they didn't take the uh, boiler, but it definitely has a, a unique build. It's not similar to many wrecks you see. Another, another image of the side. And we had crystal clear water this day. Um, it was just perfect. We went out to the Fox Islands. Um, not a lot of people get out there. We left from Leland. It's 26 miles to the south tip uh, of South Fox. So... By the time we went out there, uh, it was a very big journey. We, uh, we had this calm glass water. I mean, you could literally throw a rock and watch the ripples in this water. It was just uh, amazing, unbelievable, perfect day to go out to the Fox Islands because it's very dangerous to go out there because you're around 30 miles out when you get around the island a little bit and there's no harbors, there's no protection. Uh, that's why there's so many shipwrecks around the Fox Islands. Um, we had two days exploring shipwrecks, and I believe we explored uh, around 10 shipwrecks that day. Um, over those two days. We stayed on our boats and uh, grilled on the beach and stuff and kind of just checked out every single coordinate location that Brendan Bala gave us. Uh, here's a picture of my wife, Bia. She was uh, along with the journey here. Um, she was doing some of the dives with us. 
another another great picture detailing the wreck there. Yeah, a little issue here. Something's going on with my keyboard. Uh, one one moment. I don't know what's up here. There we go. All right, this is the Grace Williams. Uh, the Grace Williams sank on April 28th, 1896 in a gale in between the Manitou Islands and 204 feet deep water. Uh, again, a very technical dive, very deep. Uh, we didn't have much bottom time on this one, around 17 minutes. But we were able to get some great shots. You can actually see the steering wheel and the helm. Uh, it's tipped over in the, in the light by the one of the cargo holds um, in the, the old boiler stack there. Uh, this, this shipwreck was used to actually salvage uh, other shipwrecks. Um, so she became a shipwreck herself in time. Uh, mm. The captain wasn't on the vessel when she sank. Uh, the, the actual original captain was uh, swept off the boat in a gale wind uh, near the Fox Islands. Um, and the boat was uh, later purchased and under tow from the Fox Islands. And as it was going into the Manitou Passage near the Manitou Islands, uh, gale wind came up, broke the vessel free, and it sank. Uh, again, not many people have, have uh, ever dove this. There's not many pictures online at all, other than uh, I think just two or three people um, have actually shared photographs of this wreck. It's not on any underwater preserve. Uh, it's uh, in a un, it's a, a private location uh, because of its depth and just because some of these vessels, the people that find them, they don't uh, want a bunch of other divers going on there that might disturb artifacts and take artifacts. So I've been lucky enough to give them the coordinates for many ships to uh, go and check them out um, by different historians and, and other divers as well. So this, this is one of them. Uh, th this is the anchor. You can see the anchor. Now the, the vessel is completely encrusted in zebra mussels. Uh, that's what all that stuff is on the vessel. Um, but you can, you can see the anchors getting illuminated right there. Uh, this is the windlass uh, in the front, again, encapsulated in zebra mussels. Uh, this is the Vega. The Vega sits off the north side of South Fox Island, and it was a 300-foot long steel freighter. It's a cargo freighter that, again, was caught in a gale wind, and it ran aground. Um, this particular site's only around 30 feet deep. Um, I believe she moved a little deeper over the years through ice pushing her and just basically tearing this, this wreck apart. Uh, there's not much left of her other than her, her hull and, and steel pieces everywhere. Uh, the windlass is still on, on site as well. Um, picture of my wife going over parts of the hull. Uh, she sank on November 29th, 1905 off South Fox Island. And you can see it's relatively shallow, but just crystal clear, beautiful water. Um, we're very lucky to have these conditions to do all these dives out there because uh, it just gets so windy and you got to, you got to, there's nowhere to go. There's no harbor. There's, there's nowhere to really even get out of the wind on the Fox Island. So if you ever go out there and if you want to ever go and explore any of these shipwrecks, just let me know. We can get you coordinates for uh, most of them. Um, but just be sure that, you have a really good plan and watch the weather because it's a place that, you know, if you're 30 miles out, you don't want to get caught out there. Uh, my, my entire trip uh, was 101 miles uh, during, during this trip. Uh, we're going to, we're going to move over to the Falcon shipwreck on South Fox Island. We think on November 7th, 1909 in a gale wind as well. Uh, this is my wife, Bia. Um, this is another one of the wrecks we explored over those two days we went out there. I went out there actually twice last year. Uh, this was on the second trip. So this is the stern of the Falcon, Falcon and where the prop used to be mounted. Uh, the prop shaft used to be bolted right down on that flat plate right there. So this shipwreck has been salvaged as well. 
um, probably many, many years ago. Uh, there's no pictures online or publicly shared of this shipwreck either, uh, other than my photography that you're going to see here. Um, these wrecks are, are fairly new to a lot of people. Um, I'm going to continue to explore them uh, in the spring. So here's another uh, picture. And, and the way this shipwreck's situated, it's really cool. It's over about a three or 400 square foot area. And the hull goes up on a berm. And you can see that in the middle, um, the middle part of the, the rack there. It actually goes straight up this really extreme, uh, tall, rocky berm. And then it, it, because it was on that, it broke in half. Um, and then you know, there's other parts of the rack just kind of scattered about everywhere. You can see uh, very large concrete blocks and ropes and chains and stuff still that were left behind. Here's another picture on the other side of that berm that I was describing. You can kind of see it in the, in the picture of the rocks. Um, the shipwreck goes up and it breaks and it comes back down into the sand. Now we're gonna head over to the Walter L. Frost on South Manitou Island. She ran aground November 4th, 1903. So as you can see, the majority of these wrecks uh, have been in November and probably 80% of the wrecks I'm gonna share in this presentation were in November. Very dangerous month to be out on the Great Lakes because of the changing seasons. We have extreme gale winds that start. So uh, this vessel was, she ran aground 1903 and was actually um, flattened by the Francisco Morazan. Uh, one second. All right. So in 1960, this vessel was ran over by another shipwreck in the exact same location in a gale wind, similar uh, weather. And it was pretty much flattened and decimated at that time. Uh, but you can see the groove, this is the stern. That's where the prop shaft used to sit in that wooden groove uh, right there, just, just like the Falcon. Um, this is another dive we did uh, on the Walter L. Frost. Um, this is, this is a, another diver friend of mine from Drummond Island. His name is Dan Vaught. And I invited him to, down, to dive some of our uh, Manitou Passage shipwrecks over the summer. Um, when we got out to the site, it was very windy, wavy. Uh, we kind of went for it. We were able to pull it off. Um, but what was cool is that the wood, you could actually see the, the color of the wood and the grain of the wood unlike the first picture I shared right here, that's covered with moss, or not moss, but algae. And uh, the sand had been churning so much that it actually scrubbed off all the algae, revealing the actual color and grain of the wood, which is neat to see. Another picture of that, a very, very long rack, over 200 feet long. Picture of Dan. This is sand. So the sand we have around here kind of starts to reclaim the shipwrecks from time to time. So at any given time, a lot of these wrecks can be either completely covered back up or uncovered depending on the currents and the wind patterns of each year. Uh, there's another wreck that is out on the Manitou Islands called the Three Brothers that it only gets uncovered around every 30 to 50 years. Uh, was this recently uncovered around six years ago? Uh, and it covered back up right before I started diving. So I'm waiting until the day that the Three Brothers becomes uncovered again. So this is kind of showing you how the sand can just creep over these racks and reclaim them. This is the Fletcher. The Fletcher sits at South Fox Island and she sank on November 7th, 1909. Wow. Again, this is a very big rack, crystal clear water. So this rack sits in three different locations about three to 400 feet from each other. Um, there's a boiler, there's the main part of the hull, and then there's the sides of the wreck. Uh, story is on this, the, the gale wind was so strong that it blew the Fletcher into some 
some rocks and it just decimated the boat. Uh, everyone was able to get off the Fletcher and they all survived. They were rescued by local Native American fishermen uh, that were in the area that, that went out to the Fox Islands and rescued these sailors. Um, the next picture I believe is uh, the boiler. So this is, this sits just, you know, a couple few hundred feet off the wreck. So these are some of the rocks, as you can see, uh, these rocks are around seven feet long and five to six feet tall. Um, this vessel hit these rocks and it just ripped it apart instantly, um, just decimating it. And the, the accounts from the sailors were quite violent uh, storm, you know, that they were in and their experience was pretty harrowing that they all lived, you know, fortunately they, li they lived, it was in pretty shallow water. This is around only 12 feet deep. So again, it just rammed up on the shoal. We have shoals all over our islands up here. Uh, this is the Alva Bradley. The Alva Bradley was a three-masted schooner, 192 feet long. She was lost in a gale October 13th, 1894. Um, the Alva Bradley was one of the most beautiful uh, three-masted schooners that sailed the seas back in 1894. Um, she, she was caught in a gale again and hit a shoal um, right off North Manitou Island. And we were actually freed over this. Uh, this is a picture of Dusty free diving, um, just in her wetsuits, very, very cold water. But uh, she sits around 28 to 32 feet deep. And we decided just to do some free diving on it that day. Another, another picture, uh, that, that beautiful color water almost like the Caribbean. The water is different colors in different areas of the Manitou Passage in Leelanau County because of the, the bottom, some of it's rock, some of it's clay, uh, some of it's just, you know, sand. So it makes the water kind of different colors. Here's a picture. This would be the picture of the um, bow. And you can actually see, if you look real closely, the steel billets, there's these rectangular steel billets still uh, in the vessel that are artifacts um, that everybody left alone, which is great. There's a few artifacts left on, on this vessel. Um, there's some dead eyes in the sand, but again, it, it had been salvaged uh, pre-1980. You know, uh, most of these vessels around the Manitou Passage uh, did that are shallow because before 1980 or 1981, when the shipwreck law went to effect, um, everything was free game. A lot of furniture makers stripped these boats for furniture and coffee tables. Uh, wow. took the artifacts, the dead eyes, the, the steering wheels, you know, anything they could get their hands on, they sold them uh, legally at the time. And you can still actually get some of these artifacts, but um, some of them have been returned to different museums and stuff. And, and if anybody does dive any of these wrecks that I show or any wrecks in the Great Lakes per se, just please leave everything alone. Don't touch it. Don't pick it up. Don't move it. Uh, just enjoy it. Take some pictures. You know, it's our, it's our history. This is historical. These are grave sites. Um, you know, let's let's keep this, let's keep our history intact as much as we can. Uh, it's already suffered enough from the salvage attempts, you know, pre-1980. So uh, here's a, a dead eye that a friend of mine noticed that was buried under the sand and we kind of just brushed away the sand a little bit. Um, this was probably 50 feet off the vessel. And this is a dead eye that was handmade out of wood back in the 1800s, very neat to see. Um, this would have been, you know, an artifact that people would have been looking for, but uh, unfortunately they didn't find it because it was stuck in the sand. We just left it in place, took some pictures of it, share with everybody. This is the William T. Graves. Uh, this wreck is very close to the Alva Bradley, actually. It's um, right off the, the shoal of Donner Point. Donner Point's one of my favorite places to go. Uh, it's huge sand dunes that overlook picturesque waters, um, overlook South Manitou Island. So this uh, on North Manitou Island, there's a shoal that comes off and it's claimed a lot of vessels. Um, we're going we're gonna to check that out. So again, this, this wreck most likely hit the shoal, hit some rocks and just sank instantly. Um, the people were able to get shore on this as well. Uh, picture my wife and you can see she's not in a wetsuit this is late summer we were we were diving 
uh, just in our bathing suits, the water actually warmed up so much this year um, that we're lucky to, to be able to do that a little bit. Usually it's very cold. Picture of the hall, the ribs. Uh, this is the rudder of the William T. Graves, which is nice to see. Uh, nobody salvaged that for a coffee table or something. You know, it's just still there to enjoy. Um, it's nice to, to look at and see how these different rudders and, and parts of the ship were built because they are so stripped down and ripped apart. Uh, we can actually see some of the early methods of shipbuilding and, and they are, they're all different, you know, pins and bolts and um, various ways to build these ships. And it's, it's interesting to uh, kind of go back in time and see how these things were all handcrafted. You know, we didn't have factories back then and we didn't have all this automation. Uh, everything was handmade. Uh, which makes me give a little bit more respect to it as well. So this shipwreck, uh, this shipwreck is unidentified. Uh, it's on North Manitou Island and it's right 1200 feet from the William T. Graves that I just showed. Uh, also right near the Alba Bradley. So three wrecks and a very close parameter to each other, uh, all very shallow. Um, this wreck is only 14 feet deep. You could snorkel it with your family, kids come check it out. Uh, it's kind of hard getting in there because there's some shoals and some huge rocks. You got to watch the prop on your boat and be very careful when you're entering these areas to see some of these wrecks. But uh, this wreck's actually misidentified. And it was misidentified by Verana, uh, another shipwreck uh, historian and, and hunter. Um, it's misidentified in the Manitou Passage Underwater Preserve as well. Uh, the J.B. Newland, which is what it's labeled as, actually sailed uh, much longer than this vessel was determined to have went down. And the J.B. Newland actually is in Canadian waters, not here in the Manitou Passage. So this wreck is unidentified. Uh, Brendan Bala did an investigation over the last few years on this particular site and proved that it wasn't the vessel that it was thought to be. Um, these things are hard to identify. You know, there's not much left of them. You got to go with measurements on the different ribs and, and center beams and stuff and try to try to match everything up uh, with the time frame. And, uh, you know, it can be quite a process. So this is an unidentified wreck. Um, this is a boulder. I had to take a picture of this because this is, this thing's probably 10 feet long and about seven feet tall. And I would imagine the vessel hit it. Uh, and if you can imagine a vessel that's 150 foot long crashing into a boulder this size, it's pretty much uh, game over, you know. So another shoal took the vessel down here off of Donner Point. Uh, another wreck right on Donner Point. Uh, like I said, it's just littered with wrecks. Um, this one is right off the shore. It's eight feet deep, very shallow wreck. Um, all four of the wrecks that I just described all four of them you can see on google earth and if anybody wants to know any of the locations of these wrecks i will be more than happy to share them other than the grace williams in the west in westmoreland so any wreck other than those two in this presentation if you, anybody wants to know where they are are at just let me know and uh, i can definitely get your coordinates as long as you just take care of the site and uh don't disturb anything and, and just take pictures so this is off a of diner point um, this is a wreck. We're going to jump uh, north of where I live. So this is in the Straits of Mackinac. Um, this is the M Stalker. And I wanted to dive the M Stalker for several years. Uh, I finally got to uh, this year. Um, we actually did a lot of diving during the quarantine. I had um, various uh, scuba shops and people filling my tanks out the back door. And we continued to dive probably more than I've dove uh, all year because I actually had shut my electrical contracting business down for two months. So I took that opportunity to uh, just continue to dive more than I ever have during those two months. And we covered a very broad range uh, of area in the Great Lakes. Um, so we spent a lot of time up in the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, built in 1863, the M Stalker was named after her captain, Malcolm Stalker. She sank after 20 years of shipping in 1886, sinking with her load of iron ore. So she went down so hard with her load of iron ore that it actually split the bow open when it hit. Um, and she's still like this today. 
Uh, we actually did a really, I did a really cool swim through, uh, did a penetration dive through this wreck. So this is inside the M stalker and you can see the light illuminating down softly by the ladder. Uh, I didn't, I didn't turn any of my lights on or anything. I, I'm really into natural lighting. I, I love how the light washes things, you know, we have good visibility and it's not too dark down there. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I do is without artificial lights. I, I just, I'm really into having natural lighting. So this is a picture inside. Um, I actually have a video of that on my, on my Facebook diver page. It's seven minutes long. Um, and, and, you know, if you guys want to check it out, it's really cool. I, I filmed it with my new camera, my Sony a7 Mark III. It came out great. Um, so this is the, this is the Francisco Morazan. Uh, the Francisco Morazan was built in 1922 and was lost in a snowstorm on November 29th, 1960 in Gale Winds. Uh, so this is the rack that sits above water. And over the years, this wreck used to be completely intact. The bow used to be on it. Um, the stern used to be attached to it still. Uh, over the years, the bow has now sank into the water, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. And you can penetrate into this wreck very easily. It's only about 17 feet deep. Um, the engine room, the boiler still, everything's still in there. Uh, it's, it's amazing to see. You can swim through the, the whole engine room and uh, check out the stern now that's underwater. The stern um, broke off the ship in 2014. We had a very cold winter, which was zero degrees to negative 10 for over a month, 2014. And it just, the sheet ice and ice uh, forming on the ship took the stern underwater. Um, so this, this is the wreck that flattened and hit the Walter L. Frost. So in 1960, this wreck ran over another shipwreck in the same exact location. So if you go out to the uh, South Manitou Island, you can go to this wreck and, and you can see it on Google Earth as well. Um, just around 300 feet uh, southwest of this wreck is the, is the Walter Frost. So a great, a great spot to go hit both wrecks right there. Uh, this picture my wife, uh, Bia, took of me. This is, uh, this picture was actually taken years ago when we kind of first started scuba diving. So, um, some of that stuff is, some of the stuff I shared was from back then. Uh, this is, this is inside the engine room of the Morazan and you can see it's just littered with, you know, valves and pipes and parts and pieces and stuff. Um, there's also, um, a bunch of old like propane tanks and oxygen tanks that somebody had, I think put in there or it was part of the cargo I'm not sure um, you know so it's very neat you can spend a lot of time in there uh, just be very careful this isn't a rack to go to when there's a south wind uh, it makes a very strong surge inside the rack and you can be torn to pieces inside of this rack because there's a sharp metal and stuff everywhere um, I was actually in it one time in a south wind with Dan Vaught and he uh, videoed me you know, pretty much getting slammed up against this boiler. Um, it was calm and then all of a sudden the, the water surge came up and threw me around a little bit. So I learned my lesson and uh, try to just go out there and North Wind is the best time to explore the shipwreck because it's on the south side of South Manitou Island. Uh, this is the stern. This is my wife, Bia, uh, just going over the stern, crystal clear waters this day. Um, that's one of the islets that the either anchor would go through um, or the boring lines. And you can see the windlass blower. That's what used to coil up the uh, anchor. So this is a really cool over under shot. You can see the bow underwater and above water as it is uh, today. This, this picture was taken just recently during the quarantine uh, that we had in the lockdown. Um, in the background, you can see the this beautiful, huge cliff, sand dune type, you know, uh, landscape. And uh, you can see all the birds on the rack as well. And you can see the bird in the air. So this, this shipwreck is actually a bird sanctuary. Um, there's a lot of egrets and two other kinds of birds that nest on this rack. On a uh, hot summer day, you come up to this rack and the wind's right, if the wind's blowing in your direction that you're traveling, you can smell this rack about a mile away. And 
a lot of people won't dive it because in the summer it just gets nasty. The smell is so strong from all the bird poop on the rack. There's literally hundreds of birds on this rack. And in the woods directly north uh, on the shore there, the, the birds have taken over this huge swath of forest and it's completely dead from the acidity of the bird poop from this thousands of birds uh, being up on shore as well um, and nesting and nesting on the wreck that they've, they've uh, completely killed, you know, this large area. You can see it from shore. It's just dead, the forest um, that these birds, you know, hang out in. It's kind of wild to see. Uh, this is the bow. She sitting listed on her side. Um, so the tip of it still sticks above the water right there. And this is what it looks like looking straight at it. Um, again, beautiful crystal clear water. I, I really recommend diving in the Great Lakes and in my area. If anybody wants to come up and dive with me, let me know. We can probably work something out. I'm really open to diving with new people. I, I like to show my area off. And uh, it seems like there's a lot of divers that, that don't know we have these uh, beautiful shipwrecks, these historical treasures um, just everywhere up here with this water visibility. And the water, uh, the visibility in the water is because of the quagga mussels and zebra mussels that have taken all the algae particles out of the, out of the water, uh, filtrated it. So it's a bad thing, really bad thing for ecosystem, for, but for divers, um, you can really see far. We have 100 foot vis uh, almost every day up here until about July and it starts to change dramatically. Um, and it can get pretty bad, the viz, uh, but early season, be prepared, dry suit um, would be preferred. Uh, water typically is around 35 degrees and it will warm up to 45 to 55 degrees by July. So uh, best time of the year is when it's 35 degree water and just, just bear it um, to get that amazing visibility. Uh, this is one of my favorite shipwrecks. Uh, this is up in the Straits of Mackinac again. So we're going to jump back up there. Um, this is the SS Eberward. The SS Eberward was a package freighter that served ports in the upper Great Lakes. She was launched in 1888 and sank from hitting a chunk of ice on April 20th, 1909. So um, let's talk real quick about this, this vessel. Uh, there's some very unique features. Um, if you look at the bow, it has a mushroom anchor. And this mushroom anchor, I mean, it's literally like three feet around. Uh, it's just massive. And you don't see a lot of mushroom anchors on vessels. It's a, it's a unique anchor. It wasn't its only anchor. Um, it also had two other very large anchors um, that I'll show you pictures of in a second here. So if we look at this, so the pilot house is now not on the vessel. It, it had blown off when it sank. Um, and out of the crew of 10, five people perished on this vessel. One of the gentlemen that perished, uh, his boots are still in the bow today that you can see. Um, this, is, this is on the cusp of a technical dive. Um, I would say it's a technical dive just because uh, the, the deck itself is 125 feet deep and the stern is pushing 150 feet deep now. Um, so it's a very tall vessel. It's almost three stories tall. So 30 feet tall, um, very, very large boat. Talking, uh, I think it's 247 feet long. So this is an amazing shot I got. We had crystal clear visibility when we were up there one day, just for the straights. Uh, we were so fortunate to have this visibility, but in this picture, you can see uh, one of the anchors broken through the railing, laying on its side, still sitting on the bow. Um, these anchors are around eight to 10 feet long. So uh, just, just massive anchors, you know, they're old, old school anchors that they used to use were just, they were pretty awesome. Um, and on the, on, the, on the left side of the bow, you can see another anchor that's broken through the deck as well. And it's hanging off the side and the chain's still attached. And the chain actually goes in and the chain's still attached to the windlass, which is in the bow, um, which I'll show you as well, because we did a, a really big dive on this wreck, a long penetration and decompression dive uh, on this, this particular dive. Uh, so you can also see the mushroom anchor that's still attached at the bow. So these are, these are some of my favorite points of interest on this wreck. There's also a toilet on the top deck, which is right, right back from the bow here, um, and a bathtub that you can see as well. 
So, um, and if you look at the bottom, the bow, uh, you can see the huge hole that's in it. And it's actually in both sides on the lower part of the wreck. That's a, that's a massive hole about 15 feet long. And that's where the ice hit the bow so hard that it didn't break the bow, the, the very front of the boat, but it actually smashed through the sides and she sank within minutes. Um, let's go over here. So we're gonna, we're gonna go inside. Uh, the Eber Ward. So we, we penetrated into the stern. Um, the current was kind of going past us. So we thought it was best to, to kind of go up current. So if we disturbed and silted anything up, it would, it would kind of be pulled away from us, not ahead of us for our videos and pictures. Uh, it was a picture of Dusty. I was kind of following him in there. Um, this rack, you can penetrate it. It's very beautiful inside. One of the best penetration dives uh, you can do in the straits. But it is starting to collapse. You can see the back left side, the uh, supports are, are broken in the, in the, in the bow or the, the stern is kind of collapsing there. So uh, at some point it's gonna collapse and sometimes all it takes is somebody to bump something or their bubbles, you know, to, to disturb something. Um, so if you're gonna go dive this rack, I would recommend using doubles, it's a decompression dive. Otherwise you're only gonna have eight to 10 minutes of bottom time on the deck, which isn't much. Um, my first dive on it, uh, I did when I got my deep diving certificate, um, which was, you know, when I first started diving, I got the deep diving certificate, had my first, uh, emergency underwater. I had another diver bail on me, didn't tell me, uh, long story short, you know, kind of your worst case scenario thing. I was looking for them. Um, and I had the rope rip my mask off underwater because there was five foot waves up above, uh, on the charter captain that brought us out probably shouldn't have went out, but he, he asked everybody uh, if we wanted to go. And, you know, we all had traveled a long ways, uh, two people from Detroit um, and me from Traverse City. So we decided to go out, ended up being a good dive, uh, but I learned a lot. Um, my mask got ripped off. I actually choked underwater at 135 feet deep um, and was able to not die. Uh, panicked for about two seconds and, and my training, you know, you can't panic. Um, I was able to get my mask back on and clear my mask and I actually finished my dive. But then after that, I had realized that my dive partner had bailed because one of his uh, air hoses blew. This wild two people had emergencies. Um, he, he bailed on it and uh, I had to go, go back up to the, the vessel by myself on my first deep dive. So this is my first really deep dive that I did and it was pitch black. It didn't look like this at all. We're talking pitch black, like so black, it, it looked like I was swimming in ink with five foot visibility. Um, so after that, it was either uh, I was gonna quit diving or do further training. Uh, you know, I didn't wanna stop. So um, sometimes these little things kind of put everybody in check. We have these little things happen as divers and we get through them. Um, it really makes you, it humbles you out and really makes you realize how serious it is to be that deep and how serious and quick things can happen. You know, within 45 seconds, you can be gone. So uh, let's, let's move on from that. Um, top, the left picture here, picture of Dusty going down. Uh, you can see kind of the light illuminating down. We knew we were gonna have just amazing visibility that day because of uh, the, the depth, we could see the light penetrating down into the water. Uh, we had over hundred foot vis, which is almost unheard of in the Straits of Mackinac. Um, so the top right picture is the prop and rudder and it's stuck into the clay and this vessel's just it hit so hard that it's stuck into the clay bottom and it sits perfectly upright still which is really neat to see the bottom right picture again is the prop and rudder but also you can see the silt that uh, is created from bubbles so some of the bubbles from the diver were actually traveling up and rolling up the hull over the side and and uh you know with these racks you can get in there and it can be zero viz it can go from 100 foot viz to zero, zero viz instantly if you're not careful with your buoyancy and trim and the way you maneuver around these racks um i wouldn't penetrate a rack unless you get your rack your uh rack penetration certificate because it's very dangerous you can have things poke your your uh, bc which is called your, your buoyancy control which is the vest uh, or your dry suit um and things can go south very fast uh, this is a this is an awesome picture I took. I really really like this picture. I actually took this picture through a hole in the wall inside 
of the bow of the Everward. And this is the windlass I was talking about. So the anchor on the bow that's hanging off the bow is still attached by chains to this windlass. And the boots of the gen one of the gentlemen that passed uh, on this vessel are right on the other side of the windlass. Uh, this is a picture inside the cargo hold. You can see the cargo holes. Um, this is the first level down. The third, the bottom uh, storage container part is pretty much full of silt and not really advisable to go into because it's so tight. Uh, but this is beautiful light shining through the windows and you can see down the whole vessel. Um, this, is, this is an amazing dive. Um, left side, you know, if anybody has to go to the bathroom, well, there's a toilet, uh, you know, <laughs> right on the deck. Um, the bathtub's on the bottom right and uh, the top right. It's hard to tell what that is, but I think it's a, uh, a small little like donkey, um, like a windlass that may have been powered from a donkey boiler. Um, I would imagine that also helped pull up one of the anchors. Again, it's encapsulated with, with uh, quagga and zebra mussels. Um, you can see the capstan that the, uh, in the front there in the top right picture that the rope is tied to. So there's two buoys, uh, marking buoys that, that you can go down on the bower stern. Uh, if you're going to go dive this wreck, it's amazing. Just have a good dive plan. The currents are very strong. So you can literally go down on the bow and, uh, and start going towards the stern and the currents just take you and you're just like, oh, this is great, you know, and, and kind of go along the wreck. And by the time you get to the stern, you know, just plan for it's going to take you twice as long to get back to the bow to the rope. Um, and it's 247 feet long. So you don't want to try to go up the stern and swim back to the boat. Uh, especially in a wavy day. So just keep that stuff in mind in some of these wrecks. This is the George Rogers located in Northport, Michigan. The George Rogers cut fire near Peterson Park, Michigan. So this is uh, one of my hometown wrecks, uh, Luna County that I grew up in. Uh, the George Rogers was actually the shipwreck that got me interested in, in uh, shipwrecks and, and diving in the maritime history. You know, I've been a free diver my whole life. I've been in, swimming in Lake Michigan since I was five years old. My parents taught me to swim in Lake Michigan when I was five years old. Um, you know, they couldn't keep me out of the water to the point where I wouldn't listen to them and I would swim out uh, very far. Um, they got so worried about me that they made me do uh, swim classes at the YMCA for around three years to feel more comfortable because I wouldn't never listen to them. I would just swim out and I was, I was so interested in snorkeling and, and uh, you know, just swimming in the Great Lakes and, and Lake Michigan. But back then I didn't know we had so many shipwrecks and stuff. So anyway, fast forward, I'm 41 years old now. I've uh, been diving, scuba diving for four years and uh, my wife actually located this wreck. So this wreck was a known wreck. It had been salvaged in the 60s and early 70s. Um, no photographs have ever been taken of this George Rogers other than mine uh, and my, my, my videos of it as well. Um, so my wife came across this wreck paddle boarding. So she kind of rediscovered it. Um, it's not in any shipwreck uh, books or um, underwater preserved sites. So the location is unknown. I would share the location, um, not opposed to that. Uh, the beach though is private. So keep that in mind. If you do contact me to go to the George Rogers shipwreck, um, I can tell you how to get there and where it's at. And I can show you on Google earth as well, but keep in mind that some of these wrecks are uh, adjacent to private property. So the owner's uh, property is right in front of this wreck. It's only around 10 feet deep. Um, so don't go on the shore and, you know, do all that because you actually be on private property. Uh, and I personally talked to the owners. They know who I am. Uh, we've donated some pictures to them, the owners of the property. But uh, again, you can go there and, and experience these wrecks. And I, I would more, be more than happy to share the location of some of these. So uh, the George Rogers is what got me going. Uh, my wife came back and she, she, uh, she told me about, hey, I found the shipwreck, you know, and I'm like, really, that's cool, you know, and, and uh, so we went out on paddle boards together in the middle of winter. So this is a little video I took. This is the first shipwreck video I've ever taken in my life with a GoPro uh, in the middle of winter. This is, uh, I think, in January, uh, late January. You can see the snow on the bluffs in the background. 
uh, super cold water. I only had a three meal wetsuit from free diving. Um, I almost froze to death, literally. Uh, but I was so excited to go see this wreck um, that I actually went out there by myself and took a paddleboard, took my, my uh, wetsuit. I had, to, I had to immediately go onto the beach to an area that wasn't private property. I, had, I started a little fire and I had to warm up because I was, I was starting to get hypothermic from this dive. Um, and I didn't even have scuba tanks. This is actually before I started scuba diving, the first video uh, I've ever taken here. So here's my paddleboard. Here's me uh, back before I even was scuba diving. Was super excited. Crystal clear water during winter. Uh, the water was 35 degrees, and I had a three mil wetsuit on with a, a three mil hood, which is this ridiculous for 35 degree water. But it got me into it, and uh, you know the rest is history. I've, I'm very passionate about exploring our shipwrecks and. And this is the day that it all started for me. And I, I like to share this because, you know, some, some people, everybody's got like a starting point uh, and some of their hobbies and interests that they do. And this is the day, this is the first video I've ever taken uh, in my diving career. So this is, this is a, a small tug, the George Rogers. This is some part of the boiler stack. And uh, the boiler was actually um, salvaged off the shipwreck and, and it, it was uh, put on a small barge and towed. It was towed about a mile and a half before uh, a wind came up and, and blew the, the boiler off. So the boiler itself is, is near Peterson Park. Um, the boiler is getting taken back to Northport. And I'm not sure the gentleman's name who originally got it, you know, back in the 60s, but I actually uh, I have a picture of the boiler. Uh, this is a picture, a black and white picture I took of the boiler. The, pic the uh, boiler to me looks like a robot head. Pretty cool. Um, again, handmade, all hand riveted. The boiler is very big. It's it's around eight feet long and five feet tall. This is one of the first pictures I ever took diving. Uh, I when me and my wife went there, she wouldn't do it in the winter with me at the George Rogers. She wouldn't go and, and jump in the water with me. Uh, but I, I took her back in the, in the summer. Um, so this picture was taken about four and a half to five years ago. And again, some of the first pictures I've ever taken, taken before. Um, this is right when we first started diving, so four years ago. And this is uh, the prop shaft where it used to connect into, connect into the engine, the boiler, and everything uh, used to be mounted right here. It's one of the pictures I actually took of myself, the selfie stick. That same day I went and dove it that I shared the video of, of the George Rogers. Great visibility. Some more aspects of the shipwreck. Northport, Michigan. Cool little uh, wreck site. Uh, this is one of my favorite schooners. Uh, this is the Sandusky. She was lost in a gale in September of 1856 while on her way from Chicago to New Buffalo, or to Buffalo with a load of grain. And you can see the bow sprit just comes way off it and there's dead eyes that hang off of it and the anchors on the left side you can see still uh, attached to the, the deck there and then the other anchor uh, lays on her on the right side of the picture here um, on the sand you can see the slats of wood on the ground that's the ceiling of the old cabin that used to sit on it that blew off when she went down uh, very unfortunate story on this wreck all live all hands were lost yeah sandusky in the year of 1849 and the picture on the left sandusky in the year of 2019 on the right uh, you can see the dead eye bottom right side the dead eye is what used to hold the rigging and ropes of the of the vessel you can see the uh, bow sprit and the windlass the chains are still attached so the chains are still attached to that and also still attached to the anchors the deck has collapsed on the sandusky can't really do much of a penetration dive we kind of swam through it but not much to see um so that that crank you see there uh, is where one of the masts used to be that broke off so they would crank it and it would turn turn the mass there uh, here's the windlass with the chains attached still it, to it still. This is the stern. 
Uh, you can see the helm and where the steering wheel uh, used to be. It was right about six feet up. Uh, you can see those things that were sticking up. It was right in that area as where the wheel was. I'm sure that was salvaged back in the 70s as well. Um, there's different various artifacts uh, on the left. You can see uh, a dead eye just laying there still. Um, and some of the pulleys and stuff really need to see all that because it was all handcrafted. And I love that, that this stuff was handcrafted back then. So we don't, we don't get much of that anymore nowadays. Uh, this is the figurehead. So the original, and it's a squirrel. A lot of people ask me what it is. It's a squirrel. Um, the original figurehead was cut off by salvagers. Um, it was returned and it now sits in the Mackinac uh, Shipwreck Museum. And this is a replica that was hand carved and, and put back on the Sandusky. So people could still see the figurehead. A figurehead is a, something a lot of people don't get to see anymore because most of the figureheads are either gone or the vessels are very deep that they're on. So a lot of divers don't get to, to see figureheads because of the depth. And, and a lot of them have been salvaged as well. So this is the Grecian, uh, one of my favorite shipwrecks in Thunder Bay, Alpina. Launched in 1891, the steel hulled Grecian symbolizes an era of unprecedented industrial growth in America used by JP Morgan's iron industry. So this, this vessel is huge. It used to carry uh, iron ore and it made some of the best times ever recorded in shipping history for JP Morgan. So JP Morgan um, is one of the first uh, million dollar and billion dollar industries in the United States. And it started in the steel industry and JP Morgan owns a lot of different businesses and banks and all kinds of stuff now. But uh, this is one of his prized possessions, you know, back, back when he started up. Uh, this is inside the Grecian. The stern of the Grecian is still intact. It's a great swim through, a great penetration dive. Uh, she sits at around 110 feet of water, so a perfect depth to really spend some time. We had about a half hour dive on this wreck. And uh, on this particular dive, we had an emergency. Um, the transmitter for our shear water um, dive computer that, that shows you the oxygen amount in the tank. Um, Dusty's transmitter stopped working. So we had to call the dive, but we, at least we could experience the uh, stern and do the penetration part of it. Um, so I came back uh, with Dan Vaught from Drummond Island uh, this year, and we had another great dive. We actually uh, went through the stern. The middle of it's completely flat. We got to the bow. Um, again, another big swim, kind of like the Eberward. So we prepared to possibly get into, into some decompression. If not, um, you know, just kind of watch it because you can kind of get carried away because there's so much to see and it's such a large wreck. But uh, we, we went through the whole thing. This picture of Dan with the uh, gray fins. And this, this is going over the engine and boilers on the Grecian. Uh, this is a great picture of the bow. We had really good visibility. Um, you know, I'm pretty spoiled with the visibility that we have up here in North of me, but uh, for Thunder Bay, Alpena, late in the season, middle of the season, we had some great visibility that day. Uh, very large wreck though. Um, so we're gonna jump from Thunder Bay, we're gonna jump over to, uh, back to the Manitou Passage and South Manitou Island. This is the Congress, a very historical shipwreck. Um, not many people get to see, not many people dive it. It's unbuoyed, it's 175 feet deep. Uh, you can see Dusty illuminating the windlass. Uh, there's all ropes and the anchor is still in the bow, a lot of the rigging and stuff on this vessel caught fire. The Congress shipwreck is located at South Manitou Island, 265 foot long wooden steamer built in 1867, caught fire at the South Manitou Island dock on October 4th, 1904. Um, no, no hands are lost. They pushed the vessel away from the dock so it didn't destroy the dock and it, it uh, drifted out into South Manitou Harbor, which isn't necessarily a harbor, but it's just a moon-shaped um, part of the land that they call a harbor that's a safe harbor for, for many vessels to get out of the wind. On uh, the Manitou Passage, it was the number one place to go and try to get uh, out of the wind, out of the gale winds. So there is some shipwrecks there. Um, we had to locate it with sonar. 
we had to deploy our own buoys uh, near the vessel. We do it about a, a 50 to 100 feet off so we don't damage the vessel. Um, it was a big dive. We dove this one after the Grace Williams. We also had to deploy our own buoy near. Uh, so we're not hooking the racks, we're not anchoring into them. We deploy our own buoys and we dive around our own buoys. We anchor near the buoy. Uh, we have a very you know, special way to, to dive these deep racks. So um, she still sits upright. This is, this is the bow, it's kind of splitting apart. Um, the boiler, the boiler, the engines, these are the engines and the boilers. You can see in the top right, that's the boilers. So the engines stand 33 feet tall off the bottom and you can swim through them. Um, the stern, there's really nothing left because that's where the fire started. Uh, but everything from the boilers up to the bow is, is still pretty intact other than the deck that had burned. So um, the bottom right hand corner, you can see where the deck used to be. And those are all the deck supports that are still standing up. A very, very cool dive. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for coming to my presentation. Uh, this picture was taken inside of a boiler tower that had washed, washed ashore on South Fox Island. And uh, again, I just, I want to really thank everybody for coming. I have some amazing pictures to share. If you want to follow me on, on Facebook, it's uh, Chris Roxburgh on Facebook. Chris Roxburgh Diver is my diver page. And I have so many wrecks to share still that I haven't even shared yet. Um, and, and I'm continuing to dive and I dive year round all winter long. I'll be doing some ice diving and various videos and wrecks that we're uh, planning to share. So um, thank you for coming and, and I'll, um, feel free to take questions, as many questions as you guys want, uh, go ahead. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the share screen and. Thank you, Chris. This is, this is Jennifer again. There are some questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see those or I can send those to you. And Why don't we'll you just read them to me because I can't see them. Oh, sure. Sounds great. Um, yeah, I'll go from the top okay. or the back. Um, in a general sense, everyone's saying thank you now. It's great. Oh, I do want everyone to know if they're leaving right now. This this was also recorded, Chris, this, okay. this presentation. So you can you know put that wherever you would like gotcha. um, for anyone. Um, yeah, so you said a little bit about your favorite um, shipwrecks. Someone asked about environmental changes you've seen over your time diving. Yeah. Um, it's a fairly general question, but also with that, uh, what is the closest shipwreck to line five? Um, and then those kind of questions, or if you have opinions on that, you can go ahead. I'll look through. So the uh, line five has three, four shipwrecks near it. Um, one of them is the M stalker that I shared in my presentation in the Straits. Uh, that one is, is fairly near the line five, um, probably half mile to a mile off it on the east side of line five. Uh, another very big shipwreck, uh, the biggest shipwreck I've ever dove in my life is called the Cedarville. I didn't share this on this presentation. Um, I literally have probably 10 times as many shipwrecks on my page and I'm about to share them um, that we went over, but uh, the Cedarville is 600 feet long and it it's near the Mackinac Bridge as well. It sits on the east side of the bridge. So that would be another one that would be fairly close to line five. Um, the other, uh, there's another shipwreck right off the South Tower. It's 500 feet off the South Tower. Um, trying to remember what that one's called right now. I'm drawing a blank. Another wreck that I had dove that I didn't share, but there's four shipwrecks right within the vicinity, within a mile of line five. Um, none of them are, are close enough to uh, impact line five, but uh, there's some shipwrecks and there's also some Native American stone circles and rock lines that have been recently found this year uh, by the tribe around line five that I'm actually gonna explore in the spring. Um, so, but to get back to the shipwrecks, yes, there's, there's uh, several around line five. All right, I think some people have their hands raised. I think yeah. Bets, Betsy's checking in on that. Betsy, can you see yeah. who's there? Um, it looks like Stephen McCall. Okay. 
Oh, we're still getting questions in the chat until we figure that out. So um, we have a question for winter diving. What is your recommended recommendation on wetsuit thickness and manufacturer? Well, when I first started winter diving was actually when I first started diving. So uh, I was one of the only guys that, that ever took uh, uh, my open water certificate to complete in the dead of winter. Um, I actually got hypothermia on every single dive. I had a used wetsuit, a seven mil and my gloves had holes in them. Um, I basically froze to death, but I was so eager to, to get my cert, cert, certificate, um, my certificate for open water that uh, I, I wanted to just get out there. My, my instructor actually had a dry suit on. He was fine. Um, everybody, you know, loved my enthusiasm. Uh, so to cut to the cuts of the chase here on the, you, you could use a seven mil I would use a, if you're going to use a wetsuit, I wouldn't use a wetsuit. I have a dry suit now, but if you're going to do a wetsuit, I would use a 10 mil hood um, and a semi-dry. I have a Henderson 7 mil semi-dry that I use and uh, thick gloves as well. Um, I use boot liners and uh, 10 mil boots. So um, you can do it. You're probably not going to do two dives, but you can squeeze out. If you're tough, you can do about a 30 to 40 minute dive in 35 degree water with a seven mil, but it's, it's brutal. I mean, you literally, your hands will go somewhat hypothermic. Uh, your skin goes completely numb, uh, purple, you know, sometimes your lips, um, but you won't get frostbite and you should be okay. Uh, it's just, you know, a wetsuit in those conditions. It, it's doable. You know, I was doing it. I did it for a year. Um, before I was dry suit certified, but I would definitely know less than the seven mil. I think I'm getting Steven to, okay, hi. there, he's on now. <laughs> yeah, hi, Chris. Hi. Yeah, hi, first of all, uh, great presentation. Um, really enjoyed it. the pictures were, yeah, totally amazing. Thank you. Um, also, is there any sort of like parts now over there that you'd still like to explore? I mean, is there any sort of like wrecks, like um, still any unknown wrecks that yes. you think there might be out there? Yes. Um, so we have an estimated 6,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes, okay? Yeah. The Great Lakes consist of Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Superior. Lake Michigan is one of the biggest, largest bodies of fresh water. It's the second largest in the world next to a lake in Russia. Um, Lake Superior and Lake Huron are right next to that. So these are the largest bodies of fresh water in the entire world and has some of the most historical and best wreck diving in the whole world. Um, right now, you know, there's, we're kind of in the golden era of shipwreck hunting because of the sonar. Uh, you know, guys like me, I can go out and I can actively look for shipwrecks. I have uh, sonar, you know, that, yeah. that is affordable I can get now. Um, a lot of the wrecks have been found, but there's many that haven't been. And uh, there's a lot of wrecks that have been found that haven't been publicly talked about, um, yeah. which concerns me. Um, I'm actively trying to do some stuff behind the scenes uh, about that. But there's, there's a lot of wrecks out there that people have found that they haven't told anybody or the state. And, you know, um, I would love for the public to, to learn about some of these wrecks that are kind of kept secret. Um, you know, like the Grace Williams that I shared in my presentation. No one yeah. knew about it, you know, and uh, I was given the coordinates to dive it and we shared some of the first pictures ever taken of the Grace Williams. You know, there's wrecks all over up here and I would imagine there's probably at least 200 more shipwrecks that have, that need to be found in the Manitou Passage area in, in my, my uh, area that I live in. Um, and there's hundreds of shipwrecks in every single different underwater preserve or part of the Great Lakes that haven't been discovered yet. So uh, yes, I'm going to be actively looking. Um, there's several shipwrecks that I am going to actively look for in the spring um, with Ross Richardson, uh, his help and, and knowledge. You know, he goes out there. He's very active. He just, he just recently found uh, another wreck called the Jarvis Lord. I don't know if you, you saw that on the news or not, but that was on, on you know, national news, I believe, if not local, um, nationally in, in the USA, at least. Uh, the Jarvis Lord, Ross Richardson found uh, the Westmoreland. And, you know, he's out there actively finding these wrecks. Uh, he also found the most intact preserved schooner 
in the history of the world uh, called the uh, W.C. Kimball, which was found, I believe, last year. Uh, or is actually two years ago, but he, he released um, the footage and stuff last year. So they're, right now we're at a super exciting time to go out and find these wrecks. And, and in a lot of the wrecks that I shared in my presentation uh, aren't on any underwater preserves. There's no known coordinates of them. You know, I was given coordinates by other uh, shipwreck hunters and historians. So yeah. I'm, I'm trying to bring these out into public, you know, it's like, why, why do we need to hide these away? Why do we need to be secretive about them? You know, let's, let's let the public f figure these out. Let's, let's, let's get everybody involved. You know, um, I, I really like the public, the public's involvement and enthusiasm that kind of keeps me going uh, because, you know, I'm out there going hundred miles, you know, round trip to some of these wrecks that people never see. And, and it's just fun because a lot of the uh, relatives of some of these wrecks that get a hold of me, I donate my pictures to museums and other families. And there's so much history out there that, yeah. that's untouched and unexplored. Um, you know, like I said, we're, we're in the golden era of shipwreck hunting. So uh, just stay tuned because there's a lot of exciting stuff coming down the, down the line here. Well, also, Chris, I, I know that you're very busy, but congratulations on uh, your book uh, you. coming out as well. Um, and when I get a chance, well, when we come out of, sort of COVID, sure. um, I'll be coming from Cyprus and uh, I'll be coming to Chicago. Right. And I'll definitely be looking you up, buddy. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've been Thanks planning to die yeah. with you for a while now. So I know. <laughs> talking about it. And uh, it's nice because this is the first time we've actually got to see each other uh, in person and actually I have know. a quick conversation online together. And, uh, you know, anytime you want to Zoom me or you know, any of that uh, FaceTime me, just, just hit me up because uh, yeah. I, I love to talk shipwrecks and stuff. So uh, thank you yeah. for attending. And, and you know, you're, you're in another country overseas. Uh, what country are you in? I'm in Cyprus in the okay. Mediterranean. Okay. So, yeah, um, it's amazing how much interest, uh, you know, is kind of, I've got, I've got going in the Great Lakes uh, shipwreck um, diving. And it's, it's great because yeah. people are going to start coming over here now. And it's going to help yeah. our tourism. It's going to help our, our restaurants. It's going to help our dive industry, our dive shops, you know. So uh, I'm very excited that so many people yeah. are, are checking the stuff out. Um, and I want to dive with with people, you know, and I want to dive with you, you know, Steve. Yeah. So I yeah. appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you can get come over here uh, this coming yeah. spring or summer. Yeah. Get over I'm here so, so out in my boat. <laughs> so. Please. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Great, great, great presentation and uh, stay safe, everyone out there. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll have um, we just booked we had Ross Richardson last month and we booked him again. Um, I think January 27th at 630 to okay. talk about his new find. Right. So that'll be that'll be just as interesting as this. Um, yeah, I but I don't have it up on the website or anything yet because we just we just finalized it yesterday. Okay. So. Yeah, Just once you guys do, I'll, uh, I'll share the link on my, my diver page as well. Um, fully support Ross. He's a great guy. Uh, we like to, to talk shipwrecks and drink coffee, you know, once in a while. Um, yeah. Got some exciting stuff going on here. He's going to help me build a, uh, a new sonar a tow fish system for my boat. And so we got some stuff we're going to work on over this winter. And uh, a lot of the information that I have on these shipwrecks was actually from Ross Richardson. Um, he has original literature from the 80s and 90s that no one has. And uh, I was able to go over to Ross's house and, and he shared this information with me on these different books and stuff. Um, so I was able to put together some of the information that I shared in this presentation from Ross. So thank you, Ross. Um, there's a question about rabbit ship. Does that mean salvage? Does that mean taken illegally? So, Is that what so, salvage or? No, um, a rabbit steamer is just a uh, kind of like a unique uh, steamer, a unique vessel that was built particularly probably by the owner that built it. So these these rabbit steamers were these weird uh, vessels that all look different and they're kind of just hobcobbled together from the owners, you know, so like the Grace Williams was really strange looking. Uh, people that know about shipwrecks and vessels, you know, they look at these, they're just like, wow, it was built this way and, and this guy did this this and he attached you know the windlass here and he put the whistle there and, and kind of you know um the rabbit steamers weren't really produced by these large uh shipbuilding companies they're more locally built uh hand built by the owners the owners families so that would be like a rabbit steamer so i show i shared two rabbit steamers um one was the grace williams 
And uh, one was the unidentified shipwreck the, on North uh, Fox Island. Um, so that's kind of a rabbit steamer, just this uh, odd, you know, hand-built kind of vessel, so. Yes, yeah, someone else asked in the chat, speaking of, um, you know, books, uh, do you recommend any books on the history of some of these wrecks? Um, is there anything out there that's written, someone asked, so. Oh yeah, um, we got some great authors. Uh, Ross Richardson, is definitely one of my favorite authors. Uh, he wrote a book on the Westmoreland. Definitely check that out. Um, there's a lot of the wreck books, you know, are, aren't recent. So a lot of this stuff was from 10, 20 years ago. But, uh, you know, if you guys just Google Great Lake Shipwreck books, there's a lot of different authors that will come up. And uh, I myself just wrote a book during the quarantine and before it, I've been actually working on it for four years. But uh, during the quarantine, I had time to really focus and put together the information and research and, and really put together my photography for the book. It's called Lilna Underwater. Um, it's a uh, book of many of the Leelana County and Manitou Passage shipwrecks. Not all of them, you know, um, but a lot of them that I've been to. Uh, many of them were on this presentation and also it covers some of the history of the wrecks and some of the pictures I've never shared before in there as well. Um, and I actually sold out my first uh, run print of 500 books. I sold out in pre-sale just in a couple weeks. I'm actually sending the book out next Thursday. I've waited a month past when it was, I was supposed to get it because of COVID it slowed down the printing factory and the binderary that did my book. So I was supposed to have my book around November 25th. I'm not going to have it till December 10th and everybody's going to get it before Christmas. I send it out priority. I got all my packaging ready to go. So as soon as I pick this book up, I'm supposed to pick it up on Wednesday morning um in indiana i'm going to drive back on wednesday and i'm going to start shipping these things out thursday and everybody should have them within five days of, of ship date so uh i got a thousand more books coming december 26 um from a, a different printing company i use two different printing companies uh the second printing company i got it printed in canada from freezons and they're the largest printing company in north america um a lot of real well-known authors have had Friesen's print their books, and I'm really excited to see their uh, book. My first book was um, Laser Print, which came out. Colors were great. Uh, looked really nice. Um, nice binding. You know, I, I paid for all the highest, uh, most expensive, you know, options for the book. Um, so there's just a couple slight differences in the printing companies, and it'll be nice to see uh, those. Um, Friesen's from Canada does a really cool woven bind uh, that I'm, I'm really interested in seeing. But uh, yeah, so my books, my books are coming out. If you guys are interested, I'm, I'm starting a series. Uh, the first one, of course, is my, my local area, my hometown, Leelanau mm -hmm. County. Leelanau Underwater, it's called. Uh, I sell them just through my page. I have a Zoom, or uh, I'm sorry, a, a Square account that I'll be selling these books through. And I'll be posting the next sale uh, which may sell out before I get the books. I mean, the way it's been going. Um, but I'm, I'm going to post that link soon, but I'm just not posting it yet because I haven't got a 100% positive confirmation date of when I'm going to receive the books. Uh, right now, it looks like December 26th for the second run, but I want to make sure, so I'm not keeping people waiting as long as I did this time. And uh, so within a week or so, I should know that for sure. And I'll be posting another uh, link for that sale. Um, and this time I have a thousand books. So I, I should have enough to go around a little bit better. Uh, my first run sold out in about two weeks. Yeah, that's great. Um, hopefully everyone's taking down notes so they can find that. Um, I have a few other questions about some of these wrecks that you talked about today. Um, did, did the 10,000 pieces of gold get taken off the rack from 1854? For my knowledge, no. Uh, it was found in 2010. There was many people that had looked for that wreck. Uh, if you read the book on the Westmoreland, it would blow you away. Some of the shipwreck hunters that traveled very far to try to find the wreck, some very famous ones, two local guys. I'm not gonna mention names because they didn't find it, but uh, I, I, I recommend the book and, and researching the Westmoreland, you know, very historical wreck. Uh, there's only, 
from what I know, around 10 people in the whole world that have ever dove it. So I was very fortunate to be given the coordinates to dive this. Again, it's a technical dive. Um, I'm not going to give out the coordinates for it. It's a very sensitive site. It's a grave site. It's a ghost ship. You know, uh, it's kind of like our own local Fitzgerald. Um, a lot of people passed away in that wreck. Uh, inside of the wreck, there's supposed to be 10,000 gold coins in the strong box, which is in the hold. Uh, very deep wreck, very dangerous to try to get to it. Um, for one, you can't touch them anyway. You can't disturb anything. It's a felony. It's against the law. So um, as far as I know, the gold coins are still on there. You know, we kind of just did a quick, uh, I think it was a 17 or 18 minute bottom time dive on it. I've only dove on it one time and uh, I didn't see the gold coins. Uh, today, the gold coins are worth around four to $8 million. So they're called Eagle gold coins and they were getting delivered to pay for the whole entire uh, season or year for the Garrison Army stationed at Fort Mackinac uh, back in 1854 with 280 barrels of whiskey, probably be some pretty good whiskey if the, the barrels are still sealed up um today but uh, all that from what i know is still on the vessel like i said nobody's been given coordinates to dive it so the people that have um are very professional and trustworthy divers and that's another reason why i'm not going to give out the coordinates because there would be people trying to get in there and get to it um so we're going to keep it a secret and uh i'm going to dive it more and share more pictures of it and i got a ton of pictures of the westmoreland on my on my page i have two full folders that I've shared of it. So every aspect of the, of the rack you guys can check out. Um, but I, I'm not, you know, releasing that. I didn't find the rack. It's not my place to, to give coordinates out to a rack that's such sensitive site like that. But it's, it's a rack that not a lot of people know about either. And you really need to learn about it because the West Moreland is a very historical rack. And, and a lot of the families um, of the the sailors that were on that wreck are tied to Leland and Leland area of, of, of the county I grew up in. Um, so I had to include it in the, in the, in the, in the book, you know, uh, it's actually right on the cover. Uh, the book is, is the Westmoreland illuminating the, uh, the steering wheel. So. And we did have someone ask about your knowledge of the rack of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So the Fitzgerald uh, sits in Canadian waters and it's a, a another very sensitive site. Um, it's actually illegal to dive it. Uh, Canada, their laws and shipwrecks are way more strict than here in Michigan uh, and in my area. Um, so there's two gentlemen that, that dove it and uh, pretty much caused a big uproar and um, it's very deep. It's 534 feet deep. It was the deepest shipwreck dive ever in the world that somebody actually was scuba diving on. Um, I believe it took the divers five hours of decompression to come back to the surface. Very serious dive. Uh, they had technical divers bringing them oxygen, new regulators, tanks down because they're having free flows which is your regular icing up and stuff. Um, but they went down and they touched the, the, uh, the stern of it where it said Fitzgerald. They actually touched it, took pictures of it and, and left it there. Um, you know, as we know, everybody passed on the Fitzgerald and uh, it's just a site that, you know, no one can go to unless it's like research vessels that have been given permission by Canada uh, to do that. So, you know, it's Fitzgerald's a great, you know, one to learn about, but honestly, we have so many vessels, shipwrecks that, that we need to learn about and explore. Um, you know, everybody thinks shipwreck, you know, they always think of the Fitzgerald, they think of the song, you know, about it and stuff, but there's so much more out there that, that we can learn about, um, like the Westmoreland and all these different, different shipwrecks that I explore. So uh, I, I like the Fitzgerald, you know, I'll never dive it, um, but you know, there's a lot more out there to, to check out, so. Betsy, are you seeing any more questions? If I missed any in the chat, please re, I'm trying to scroll through as I go, but if there's any other questions out there, certainly anyone is <laughs> yeah, welcome. Someone, someone just asked if you knew Becky Kagan shot, Emmy award winning oh, yeah. 
underwater cinematographer, et cetera. Yeah, I'm friends with Becky. Um, she's she's personally trained my dive partner with the Mag Rebreather system that she trains people on. She's, you know, one of the most well-known female divers in the world, if not the the most well-known uh, underwater for underwater um, female photographer in the world. Uh, Becky follows me. She supports me. She's uh, very inter interested in what I'm doing. Um, like I said, she personally trained my dive partner um, just recently, and uh, we we chat and we support each other on online and Facebook and on Instagram. Um, so yeah, Becky and I know each other. Had many conversations with her. Um, so yes, Becky's amazing. I follow her. I love her photography, and she's one of the people that actually inspired me to do what I'm doing, um, you know, kind of take it to the next level. When I first started scuba diving, uh, I would always, always follow her and watch her and I'm like, wow, these, you know, look at these wrecks she's on and look at her photography and what camera she using and how she diving that. And, and, you know, it just really, really was, uh, intriguing. And over the years, um, you know, as I got to be a better diver, and started networking with her friends and other divers that she networks with. Uh, we're all kind of, you know, in this little circle of people together that we support each other. And Becky, Becky Schott's an amazing person to follow. I recommend following her as well. Um, she will literally blow you away the stuff that she does. And she dives, you know, these deep, dark, spooky shipwrecks that uh, not a lot of people see. So yeah, I, I totally know about Becky and, and she knows of me as well. Someone asked a question early on. They said, how deep is it? And I think they were talking about the wreck that was off the Fox Islands or in that area. Yeah, so uh, we covered quite a few South and North Fox Island shipwrecks. Um, they're all fairly shallow. There is some deep ones around the islands uh, that I haven't got the coordinates for yet. Um, I will be looking this spring in that area. But again, it's very hard to get out to. So not a lot of guys can even go out there to, to do sonar work because the wind, and there's nowhere to get out of it. And it's just, it's just dangerous. It's straight up dangerous. You know, if your boat sinks, you're done. Like no one's gonna get, you know, come get you unless the Coast Guard's gonna come 30 miles out there and get you. So um, around the Fox Islands though, the shipwrecks that I shared, uh, the deepest shipwreck was at 35 feet. And that was the Falcon. Uh, the unidentified rabbit steamer was at 30 feet. And the Fletcher was at 15 feet deep. Um, the Vega was at 28 feet deep. Um, let's see. And there was, there was a bunch of other ones that I explored as well. Uh, that I just didn't share in my presentation. I just couldn't put everything in there. But uh, if anybody wants some of these coordinates from these rocks, I, I'm more than happy to share. I have a whole shipwreck map, like a, like a legit shipwreck map that has all the coordinates on it, you know, um from brendan bailout and he publicly shared it as well in a private uh rec group but a lot of people have seen it you know um and if you're planning to go out there and check out these wrecks love or shallow and you can see them on google earth i can show you that as well uh just be prepared to get out there and and really take it serious because you could go out there and it could be beautiful like the day we went uh, it was glass calm. I mean, it was literally like the calmest day I've ever seen out in Lake Michigan. Uh, we went out the next day. Um, you know, when I, the next day was foggy, so you couldn't see 30 feet. And I had to come back that evening and I had to drive around 26 miles across Lake Michigan back to Leland Harbor. And, and it was scary. Um, we got a lot of, a lot of these things in the water called deadheads. So what a deadhead is, is a floating log or dock because we have a lot of erosion going on right now all over Lake Michigan. So what the erosion does is it pulls out people's docks and it pulls out their stairways and it pulls out the trees and they float and they float out there um, and they're all over the place. So just be very careful. Uh, it never used to be like that when I was younger. Nowadays, um, I see logs that would literally go through my hull and sink my boat in like two seconds that are just float by. So if you're cruising 30 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour in a boat, heading out to uh, the Fox Islands, you know, you better have someone watching from your bow and just, just take it serious because if you go down out there, there's no cell phone reception at all. And I'm serious, it, it, you're in a blackout zone. 
at the Fox Islands is zero cell phone reception. We actually went off the grid for, I think, around 50 hours when we went out there. Completely off the grid. You know, I couldn't get a hold of my children. I couldn't get a hold of my family. If something happened, uh, you better get your, you know, have your CB radio. But if your boat sinks, you don't have that. You don't have your cell phone. You're, you're in some serious trouble. Um, so definitely the wrecks are, are all beginner wrecks that I shared uh, in the Fox Islands and, and great place to go. But uh, it's just, you, you got to really have your stuff together to get out there and have a great plan and make sure the weather's going to be okay for you. So. I can't hear. I think you're muted, Betsy. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was just talking. <laughs> what year did the Bella sink? What's that? It was one of the, what year did the Bella sink? That was the Bella? one question. I didn't share a wreck called the Bella. Okay. Maybe I read it wrong. Um, do you think that they'll ever find the Griffin? Was that another one? <laughs> oh, the Griffin. <laughs> The, the holy grail of all shipwrecks in the Great Lakes is the griffin. You know, the griffin is from the 1600s. So I personally haven't dove a wreck that's that old. I can only imagine that if it was in deep water, it's probably still there, at least parts of it. Uh, nobody's been able to find the griffin. The whole crew of the griffin disappeared with the, the ship. Um, and it was, it was going through waters that are north of me, you know, real near to where I am. So I don't know if anybody's ever going to find the Griffin. We can hope and pray that somebody's going to find the Griffin someday and kind of have closure to its story and be able to share pictures of what it looks like today. But since it was so long ago when it disappeared that, uh, I just, I don't know about that one. I don't know if anybody's going to find that one. I, I, I'm doubtful that somebody will, honestly, because if it was to go down, let's say, in shallower water, a lot of the wrecks that I shared were in shallower waters, decimated by the ice and the currents and the wind and the winter that we have. So there's probably not much of it left. If it went down in deep water, uh, it could be extremely deep water. You're talking three, four, 500 feet deep. 600 feet deep water. Um, so it, it may never be found, but the technology, the sonar equipment that's getting used nowadays, you know, these, these uh, torpedoes that they tow behind the boats called towfish, they tow them down 200 feet down. So it shoots down four or 500 feet. And uh, we're finding all kinds of stuff, you know, all the wreck hunters out there. Um, so it, it may be found, but I just, I'm doubtful of it because of the age of it. And it was a small vessel, you know, if it would have been some really big uh, ship, maybe, you know, it would have been easier to find, but the size of it and, and the time uh, frame that it went down and stuff, it's doubtful, but we'll see. I, we can all hope we can all, you know, talk about the Griffin, everyone, you know, every few years, somebody thinks they found it and stuff and it's proven that they haven't. So, um, We'll see, you know. Um, have you, is it mainly this area that you dive or have you gone elsewhere? And one question specifically was like Lake Tahoe. Good question. Um, yes, so I've dove uh, many places. I've dove Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan. I've dove in every single underwater preserve in the state of Michigan. I've dove with locals up in the Keweenaw Peninsula this year, uh, which was amazing. Not a lot of people dive up there. There's no dive shops, you know, up there. Um, so I've dove in Lake Tahoe, free dove. I haven't scuba dove, I haven't been scuba diving in Lake Tahoe, but um, my wife actually lived in Lake Tahoe for seven years before she moved back to Traverse City. So uh, Lake Tahoe definitely holds a special place in my heart. And I, I will share some pictures on my page from Lake Tahoe. It's as crystal clear, the cleanest water I've ever seen, uh, mountain fresh, you know, super cold. I was actually free diving in a, in a bathing suit. Um, we were camping out in the desert, uh, out at a festival called Burning Man. And after that, every year we'd go to Lake Tahoe and visit our friends and family. And we kind of just uh, reset at Lake Tahoe um, 
you know, we're out there building, I'm doing electrical out there for the infrastructure. There's all kinds of stuff that I did out there. Uh, we come back just covered in desert dust, you know, sunburnt, the worst you've ever seen out in 110 degree weather for a week. We go right to Lake Tahoe and uh, we would spend two or three days at Lake Tahoe and I, I was free diving every day. Um, I've dove down in Florida, Miami, uh, I've dove in the Keys. Um, I also took a trip over to the Virgin Islands uh, right after Hurricane Irma, which was to totally devastated. I donated a week of my life to go over there and help uh, rebuild uh, some of the electrical infrastructure um, on, a, on a private piece of land for a customer um, that their brother had lived on and, ha and still is. Uh, they didn't have uh, running water or power for three months after Irma. So uh, I went over to the Virgin Islands and, and during that uh, time of helping those people, um, the last two days of it, I dove almost every uh, coral reef around St. John. Uh, that wasn't scuba diving, that was all free diving. You know, I was going 30 feet down in coral reefs all by myself alone. Uh, so I've, I've went to, you know, a lot of different places, but uh, there's nothing like the Great Lakes. And this is, this is where I, I dive, you know, the majority of my diving. And uh, I'm going to continue to share it um, as well. The one question that was, we thought was the Bella, it was actually the, the ship that split in half and fell onto another shipwreck. What year did yeah, that happen? Um, so, uh, the Walter L. Frost was ran over by the Francisco Morazan. So the Walter L. Frost was an old steamship that sank in 1903 in November. Uh, gale winds, very shallow water, talking only 17 feet deep. It ran ashore in a shoal on the south uh, west shoal on South Manitou Island in the Manitou Passage, um, my, my home area here. Um, and then, so it sat in, intact until 1960 where the Francisco Morazan, which was only one of three ocean going steel freighters that sank in the Great Lakes. Uh, one of them's the Francisco Morazan. It, uh, it, it ran right over the frost and completely flattened it. And they both sit within 300 feet of each other. There was another question about what dive institution are you training with? So I train with Scuba North. Um, my personal trainer is Bob Thorpe. He's one of the best divers in the Midwest. Uh, super professional team he has. I've, I've, I've also had other instructors there that I've worked with, but my favorite's just working straight, straight with Bob, just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's who I did my technical decompression diving and my advanced nitrox class with. And uh, Scuba North is located right in Traverse City. So I'm very fortunate to have that dive shop. It's probably seven minutes from my house. And Scuba North, if anybody wants to get certified in Northern Michigan, if they're available to get Scuba North in Traverse City, uh, highly recommended. Some of the most professional people I've ever worked with in my life and they will take you to the next level if you want to, if you want to go there, so. I think that's all the questions I see, Jen. Okay. Yeah, me too. I've been scrolling through. If anyone has more questions afterwards, you know, contacting Historical Society or Chris as well, I'm sure we can get answers because oh, I know yeah. there's a lot of interest. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, like I said, we'll have this available on the libraries. Um, Cattle Not Just Books YouTube channel, but we'll send it out also to everyone who attended and couldn't attend. We'll email the link to you and also to Chris and Jen and, and um, the Historical Society so you guys can post it however you want. We'll probably have that ready on Monday. All right, sounds Great. good, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chris, and everyone for attending. For sure, thanks for coming everybody that's still on and uh, just stay tuned because I have Hundreds of pictures to share and many wrecks I haven't even shared yet. They're going to be coming up soon here. I've been saving them for winter. So. That's great. We'll have you back. Thank you.